Hi everyone, I'm Roland and this is Colin. Hello. And um, we will talk about how CEOs in startups are operating on a daily basis yeah. and a lot of other interesting stuff. But first I would like to ask you Colin to tell us how did you end up here in Hungary and what are you doing, what businesses are you building? Okay. Tell about yourself. Alright, it's a very, very long story, so I'm going to give you the very condensed version. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, originally I came to work for my father. Mm -hmm. um, my father bought, with some colleagues, he bought one of the uh, X branches of the Icarus bus manufacturer. Oh, yeah. Company. And um, they used that group of people, that operation, to start building a small 8 meter bus and they needed a uh, purchasing manager. Mm -hmm. So my father, I wasn't actually working directly for my father, I was working for the CEO, but he uh, invited me over to come and operate as the purchasing manager for their business. What, when was this? This was in 2006. Okay. Yes. What time? Uh, January. So now we are, what, I am here for 13 years. Yes, it's quite some time, isn't it? Okay. And Tell us how did you end up in the startup business? How okay. did you start when you started? So basically, uh, my father's company went under in 2008 mm -hmm. uh, with the Vashag or the crisis. And um, yes, I was made unemployed, but I had, uh, I had an apartment, I had a cat. Um, for me, it was, <laughs> and I'd, really, I'd invested some time in learning the, learning the language, I'd invested some time in making some friends, so I really, really wanted to stay. It's quite a nice, li nice lifestyle here. I also lived in London, and there was simply no way I could afford to buy an apartment mm -hmm. um, in, in London and have the kind of lifestyle that I had here um, back in the UK. So the goal was to stay. I looked for a job, but I couldn't find anything that was going to pay me remotely what well. the UK company I was working for that was based in Hungary was paying me. So um, I didn't really have too many options actually. I came up with the idea that since there was so many, they built 200 buses, they were, all, they were all over the world and based on the fact that the quality of the bus is not amazing, um, these things were going to break down, they were going to need parts okay. for the vehicles. And as I was the purchasing manager, I already had the network of all of the suppliers of all of these parts. So naturally, it made sense to start distributing these parts to the people that had bought these buses when they required them. So I started a small company, um, basically trading in bus and truck parts. So I'd buy the okay. parts from um, Hungary and the surrounding, the surrounding areas at very good prices because I knew what the original price was for OEM parts and then I resold them with um, a decent margin to uh, the bus operators around the globe and it's quite a nice segue actually into the business that I'm in now because we were shipping parts all over the world we had contracts with UPS, TNT, GLS, uh, all of the big players and we were very aggressive in terms of um, negotiating good rates with them. Mm -hmm. Actually, they, the rates we had were, were so good that some of our customers um, and some of our suppliers asked if they could piggyback on top of our account. So we would just give out our account number, give them a login to the site, and when the invoice came in, we would stick on you know, some margin, 10, 15, mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. to the shipping price as a kind of admin fee. And the additional volume helped us negotiate even better prices with them, so it's kind of this virtuous circle of buy more, it gets cheaper, you can sell it cheaper, you get more customers, you've got more volume, and so on and so forth. So, um, Actually, having done that, we uh, kind of sat there and thought, you know, this is, could be an interesting business model. Mm -hmm. You know, we buy really cheap these parcel delivery services. What, when was this realization after this started? was um, 2000 and probably around 2009, mm -hmm. uh, 2010. So probably actually the beginning of 2010. Okay. And um, I so it, it was like around two years after you started the whole the whole bus part yes. business. Yeah. Okay. And um, we were, um, we, I spent some time looking at, um, surely there must be some other companies doing this. And sure enough, in the UK, so naturally that was where I started doing my research. But you already had some customers? For, we already had customers, that we already had people that were buying parts off us and 
using our uh, mm-hmm. shipping account. Yep. So yeah, we basically had a very small number of customers. And having done the research, sure enough, we found that there is businesses doing this in the UK. There's a company called Parcel to Go, Parcel Monkey, Interparcel, and they've been around for a couple of years. So we checked Hungary, nothing in Hungary, and um, decided, okay, this could be interesting. Let's give it a shot. Um, we put up a small site. We came up with a name, Food Gift with Dad. Um, absolutely zero kind of long-term plan. Okay. No sort of scaling thoughts on scale. Let's just put it out there, and you know, we'll get we'll see how we'll see how we get some more money. Yeah, that was the first big mistake. Okay, uh, look, it's very interesting because you said that you've been started a business. Uh, so after two years, you yeah. started a business. Yeah, you were just starting looking for other companies who might do similar things. Yeah. So isn't it a little bit shifted because? Um, so the 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 situation. The, let's be honest. The the. Selling bus parts and trucks parts, uh, truck parts is, is not very sexy. You know, yeah. you meet new people and they're like, "Hey, what do you do?" I'm like, yeah, I sell bus and truck parts. It's not yes. a great conversation starter. Um, no, I think generally speaking, as a um, and I hate using the entrepreneur word, but generally speaking, as someone that likes to buy and sell stuff and, and try and make some money and see how we can move projects forward. Um, it, it just seemed like a, a natural thing to do. You know, we we, we had you know, I had some money. I had one and a half thousand euros. About half, I think you needed back in two thousand and yeah, around two thousand ten. You only needed about half a million foreign yes. to start a company. Yeah. So we just started a company. We got we just gave it a try, and it started to grow actually uh, quite quickly. We were surprised and. Um, We got to 2012, and in 2012 we, um, or we, we kind of reached a point where bus parts, the growth in the parts business, it had potential, but it involved um, it involved kind of a different type of sales process as opposed mm-hmm. to this kind of online um, business yeah, where we exactly. sell parcel delivery services. But before we do that, uh, or go into that, I should really tell you what we actually do. Okay. Uh, so, an introduction to yep. Food Gift Dad, or or Packer, as we are known. Oh, it's, it's, the same, it's the same. It's the same. same. Yeah. So um, the business model is, is quite simple. As I mentioned, we um, buy shipping services or deliver parcel delivery services in bulk, in volume, um, and then we resell those. Based on that volume, we get big discounts from the courier companies. Then we resell the services at a markup to small, medium-sized companies and to consumers, so private individuals, that cannot get those big discounts directly from the courier company. So the value proposition to our customers is price, is the first thing. And the second is that we have this all bundled together on a very nice platform where if you enter the destination that you would like to ship to, the weight and dimensions of the parcel, then we have a comparison um, page where you can see all of the offers from the different courier companies. You can choose whether it should be the fastest or the cheapest or uh, a particular courier that you like. Mm-hmm. And um, you basically book on the platform, you can pay by a debit credit card, and once you've done that, the courier comes and picks up the parcel. So, and so, it, so it makes it really easy for the customers to get these parts? Yes, it's ease of use. I mean, we um, actually, um, to get the parts, get the parcels. Parcels, parcels, yeah. parcels. Yeah, to book an order, it's very, very quick. Um, they can, uh, within 45 mm. seconds, they wow. can complete a transaction and the courier will be there on the same day. That's really good. It's very, it's okay, very nice. Let's talk about a little bit uh, of the growth of your business. Okay. Because you said that it was uh, not really intentional. No, we, um, we were purely based So we drove traffic to the site using uh, performance marketing, so mostly mm-hmm. Google and Facebook. And um, yes, I think we we were lucky because we were the first on the market. Mm-hmm. We did have to invest a lot of time and energy into educating our customers in terms of what we do because people thought we were sending a driver of our own, but we don't have any vehicles or, or anything. We don't physically touch the parcels. So um, there was a period of education, but Um, very quickly we found that um, not just um, 
visitors didn't just come from, mm -hmm. from the marketing channels, but from word of mouth as well. So and so had a good experience, they told their friends and um, yeah, so it grew quite it grew quite quickly. We were able to double revenue. Sure we started at a small number originally, but we were able to double revenue year on year for the first uh, four uh, four years okay. actually. So, so it's quite nice. Exponential growth was on the table. Yes, and with, with very little energy. So in 2012, as we paused earlier, 2012, we, we got to a stage where it, we had to, had to choose with one or the other, really. So we were either going to focus on, uh, on food, get food that, mm -hmm. or, or on the parts business. And um, I was having a lot more fun with the with uh, parcel delivery. It was online. Um, it was cool and fun, and I like e-commerce. Mm -hmm. So I sold the other company. Uh, to a competitor in the UK, uh, not for a huge sum of money, but it was uh, more than enough to um, to invest more funds into food uh, food that and take it to the next level. Okay, uh, go on. Go no, on. I can keep talking. Yeah, and I'm be here forever. <laughs> okay, about the story. Okay. Um, how did you learn how to how to grow up for these tasks? What, yeah. What, what was your internal process? Okay, so you need to understand that my background is in product design. So I have no limited business, um, uh, had limited business experience. Mm -hmm. um, I'd worked in sales and purchasing for a substantial amount of time. So I picked up um, some basics, um, some basics then. But I, um, in terms of running a company, it, it really was on the job kind of training. And um, I think, you know, with some common sense and, and some logic, mm -hmm. as, as long as you uh, continue to challenge yourself uh, with regard to is this the right decision, what are the long term effects, um, then I think you can, you can make good progress. But um, I think for me personally, the biggest, um, the, the steepest learning curve was when we brought on board investors. Mm -hmm. So we, in 2015, we decided to, uh, actually it was 2014, we knew that the uh, organic growth of the company was going to be uh, limited by the amount of cash that we actually um, were able to generate. So we were continuously recycling the money back into the business, mm -hmm. but the organic growth is, is slow when you've got a business which you think could, could really, really scale. So, so you think that uh, having an investor yeah. uh, was contributing a lot to the learning? Yes, to the learning Yes, learning. Yeah, so my, if I was to give some like bites of uh, advice, once you, um, so I think choosing an investor is very important. Um, because you need an investor that understands your business, probably has some companies in its portfolio that have a similar activity or at least are in um, the same sort of industry, for example, e-commerce, um, because they, they can really add value. Mm -hmm. So they, they've seen many CEOs go through uh, lots of different stages in, in business development and they can help steer you, providing the, they are um, asking challenging questions which allow you to think about certain directions and don't purely steer you and, and force you to go in a certain direction, then I, I think that's the right sort of investor to get on board. Do you, do you have any failures in, my, in your mind which contributed to some Maybe. later success? Yes, so to the failures that contributed to success? Yes. I have failures which I'm still, which I made when we started the company, which I'm still towing along with me, which is uh, not great. Mm. Okay. The, so fundamentally, um, if I was to do it again, then I would have built. So the IT system that we have is um, is, is probably it was suitable for. It was perfect actually for the first two or three years of business activity that we have. But as I, when I started telling you, you know, we started the company as a hobby, we didn't have big dreams for the company, um, we didn't think about scale at all. We didn't think, it, our, our, was, our, our case was like, maybe we're going to get 10 orders today, let's get 10 orders. And that was at the start. With 10 orders you can do on, you know, Kotska, Papier and, yeah. uh, and, and in Excel. Yeah, we didn't think about what would happen when we're doing three and a half thousand mm -hmm. a day. And that 
to actually have that in your mind of the decisions that you're going to make in terms of your IT architecture, what systems you're going to use, what products you're going to use, when you're hoping just for 10 orders, yes. and what you're going to need when you've got 3,500 mm-hmm. orders like nine years later. Um, so, so you don't really think about big sales number? No, absolutely not. You know, we just thought about we had a short term, a short term view continuously, and as a result, um, we pay we pay the price today. Um, as a result of of that kind of short term view of things, you have to think long term, or you have to you can have a short term view, but you need to make decisions which uh, with on, on certain things or products or whatever that you may use um, which have that kind of scalability in them so they need to be good for now yep. but they need to they need to have the uh, ability to be scalable with with the business because what will happen eventually is once you get kind of product market fit um, it should all be about okay what do you need to do to scale mm-hmm. and once um, you have the, the product market fit and you're ready to scale you can actually only scale if you've got some, you've got the foundation which will, will allow for that, which includes the right IT systems, the right team, the right people. Um, so there is iteration, reiterations of changes in all of those things as your business kind of grows. Well, let's talk about how your people, how your team okay. grows uh, during the years. Yeah, so we had some fluctuations. Um, we, I think at the, uh, we had, we're a small business. Uh, so today we have uh, 17 people in the Hungarian team and three in the Romanian team. Um, I think at our peak we were at 25 people. We, pardon me, we opened um, we opened up Slo- Romania, Slovakia, and the Czech market. Mm-hmm. Same business model, different name, or Paco. And um, Slovakia and the Czech Republic was a huge fail for us. Um, but yes, in terms of team, if we talk about selecting people. As you know, the environment's challenging yep. at the moment, um, and mostly companies like small companies, startups, uh, they don't have always have the money to pay um, for the right people. Yep. Um, my advice would always be to you should always get the, the very best you can actually afford. So, mm-hmm. and you should pay as much as you are able to pay so scrimping on um, the people oh, so it's, it's not difficult to get an average person and pay them a less than average or average salary but I would highly recommend going for you know the, the very top of which you can afford because you'll get so much more out of that person and um, there will be a lot more um, suited for the long run, as opposed to just for a short period of time. What What are you looking for? Uh, what are you looking at people when you are hiring? Besides the the, the, skills, the professional yeah. skills, yeah. Um, we we mostly mostly just look for um, their 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 work ethic, really, and their personality is of course an important thing. There has to be some chemistry there, but for us, it's kind of the work ethic, and does it fit with with our our kind of. Um, culture. As a small company we are looking for um, people that have the skill set, um, have the experience, have already made the mistakes um, and are therefore able to make less of them but are also willing to kind of roll up their sleeves and do some dirty work as well and to find those people is, is very very difficult. Yeah. 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 Um, how, do you, how do you manage your, your people? I mean do you have an office where you all together work together? Yeah, yeah, for or sure. People are working remotely. Mm, we have so the things are changing. We have an office um, in Budapest uh, on the Buddha side. The as from what we can see, the we have always been a more traditional company in terms that we like to get people into the office, and it's a classic traditional work office environment. But we can see it's changing very, very quickly. Um, the where we're unable to hit high salaries, for example, uh, we have to incentivize with you know home office, uh, flexible working hours. Um, so we try to keep things open, and we measure our employees really on, on what they deliver, as opposed to you know, how many hours they put in. So they probably put in more hours than they should. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, so home office, I think, 
it seems to be more and more certainly on the for our IT developers seems to be it's, it's a given every interview is okay how many days from office am, am I allowed um, so I think the industry is, is very much kind of changing yep. as I see uh, as our company grows and we bring on more people the likelihood is we will uh, not move to a bigger office we'll yes. maintain the, the small office and we'll just have more remote kind of uh, working okay. sort of so how do you how do you manage the the home office problem? Um, we actually, so we have, um, so one of the girls is, for us it's a new, it's a new item and we, um, I know there's companies out there that have various systems to measure the home office activity and stuff, we, we, we don't do that, we're still kind of learning. One of the, um, one of the team is uh, pregnant mm -hmm. and she will go on maternity leave at the end of this month and she lives about uh, 30 kilometers outside of Budapest and she's traveling, she was traveling to and forth every day oh, okay. and we said okay, but yeah, um, it's a lot of time, especially if she's carrying you know, a baby, I don't think it's most comfortable for yeah. us. So she, she asked, I mean, what are the options with home office and we came to an agreement that she could do four days at home and one day in the office, mm -hmm. um, which seems like a lot, but mm, it, it's, working out actually surprisingly yeah. so uh, I also think that if you have that level of trust in your employees I think it can be a good you have to have um, that they have to have responsibility and ownership yes. of a group of, of tasks um, do you do you have any kind of program in mind how you can prepare your employees for the home office I have no idea no idea <laughs> okay. okay no we're still learning I mean to um, for us the we have a new IT director and um, he has implemented uh, several new kind of initiatives which use tech and programs. Um, so we actually just started using um, a, only just now, believe it or not, started using a ticketing system, mm -hmm. a kind of ticketing CRM uh, system. We use Freshdesk, which is connected to um, a kind of an agile tool uh, which the, the developers use as well. So this is kind of a seamless um, <clears throat> process between the, the two activities that they're, they're doing and that's made a huge a huge difference for us I just don't know why we um, we didn't do it sooner Before, yeah the, the, I mean if we're looking at like creating kind of sound bites for like useful information then I would say that my biggest challenge um, and again for, for my management team as well, is as I said, we're looking for people that roll up their sleeves and are willing to dig in. But once you're kind of at that operational level, it's very difficult to kind of backpedal and have a look at what you're doing, what you're spending time on, and what you could implement, like what systems or, or um, programs or, or tools yep. to actually you know, take away a lot of that headache that you've actually got. Yeah, I, actually this is a really rare thing that yeah. people do, just to really take a helicopter view yeah. and see where I spend more yeah. time than I should be. Yeah. And this is a really good exercise. Yeah. I if, you've got, um, if you've got good investors, they'll, they'll force you to do this. Because what happens if you're having regular board meetings is they'll just hammer you with questions, okay, in different parts, about different parts of your business. And you're really you're forced, you know, you're forced to step back and just say, okay, actually, they're right. You know, they've, I'm wasting my time doing a lot of kind of hammering away at this big rock when yes. you know, we could just go and hire a jackhammer and just drill it down very, very quickly. Yes. Oh, what other systems do you use for the operation? Um, so we developed um, most of our, so it's all our own tech actually. Mm -hmm. So we developed all of uh, all of the items we have. Uh, Everything's written in. Uh, we're heavily Microsoft-based, so we are. Everything's in that kind of .NET um, and, and C Sharp. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, everything is running on the cloud on Azure, um, and we are mostly using Microsoft products. Do you, do you use anything for follow-up tasks or projects? Right, I'm going to basically, I'm going to do a plug for the Microsoft products here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, the latest suite of Microsoft is actually surprisingly good. Mm -hmm. So, um, I was pleasantly surprised. So obviously, you've got Outlook and you've got Word and Excel and the typical stuff. But I'm not talking about those items. They have, um, they have something called OneNote. Yep. 
Um, and they also have um, a, a kind of an app but it's, a, it's an app on your phone, sure, but it's also a desktop uh, or a browser-related app called To Do. Yep. And um, I know these are kind of very simple things, but because they're all kind of connected to Outlook as well and the rest of the, the MS services, uh, it, it's really changed um, the way I work. So, for example, email. Um, I, my, my, goal, my goal normally is to hit inbox zero and I know this sounds crazy on uh, every day or every other day so my plan the way I approach emails is basically um, I hammer them in the morning so deal with everything in the morning um, and any tasks that I have in it that come out of an email that I've received I move them over into the to-do uh, oh, okay. platform and then I file the email so everything gets filed um, and and the tasks go over to the to do platform, and then the, then that browser the emails get closed, and then for daily tasks or items which or projects that I'm working on, I will use my to do list, which is all mm-hmm. prioritised um, and directly connected to Outlook, which is is generally my work ethic. How, how do you communicate with the team members? Regularly? So yeah, we're using um, we're we're using Skype, believe mm-hmm. it or not. Um, so we don't use Slack or anything like that. I've heard a lot of great things about it, but we, we mostly use Skype internally, um, and we have very regular um, meetings, possibly too many. Um, so we, we we have regular company meetings, which we have every month, um, which we've learned that, that that's really good because the fundamental problem in a small company is that we're kind of at that size where. Um, we're a little bit too big to have a company meeting every week. Yep. Where, um, yes. So, but we're not kind of big enough to have some internal email newsletter mm-hmm. and stuff like that. So, um, our our management team, we we have weekly meetings, and then of course um, this gets passed down to to the rest of the the team. Any information discussed. But if we do um, a weekly, a monthly company meeting, then all of the updates that come out of the board meeting, strategy changes, and where we are with the various development sprints, um, we inform everyone about that. And we find that makes things a little bit more cohesive mm-hmm. in terms of communication. What would you recommend for starter, startup CEOs? Yeah. Yeah. You know, where to look for information which is based on valid experience, not okay. just bullshit, which is all around the internet. Yeah, um, so I, in terms of reading, so I, I tend to read these more classic... Um, yeah, it can be like books or websites. Yes, so I tend to, so I, I tend to read um, the more classic, older books, mm-hmm. so Brian Tracy um, is uh, kind of a old school sales guru or whatever but you know he's yep. written some books from like the 70s yep. and stuff um, they're, they're really good I mean nothing I'm not going to lie to you the, the principles that they had then n- nothing has changed really the, the general um, process for selling or, or, or whatever it's, it's the same as it was I really like the style of his books actually I listened to the audio book of it really um, he also has a book called uh, Eat That Frog Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure if you've. Yeah, read I know. I, I struggle. I, a, I will link it in the description. Okay, I struggle a lot with procrastination. Uh, I procrastinate a lot. The bigger the task, and the less, uh, and so if there's a big task which I don't immediately have the skill set, and it's going to require absolute brain power, I, just, I, I very I struggle a lot to to start them, and I, I've struggled with this for, you know, for, for forever. Uh, that book really helped me actually. The principle is basically if you have to eat a frog, which you don't want to do, and you have to do it every day, the best thing to do is uh, is to eat it first thing in the morning. And if you have to eat the frog, you know it's it, it's probably easier just to chop it into a couple of chunks, and then you can swallow it down quickly, yep. as opposed to like chewing it and chewing it in one in one go. So it's that's a really nice metaphor. <laughs> it's a um, it's a really good book. It's yep. actually um, helps a lot and. Uh, what else? I read some books on scaling, but I can't remember uh, who who the author was. Um, for uh, podcasts, I, I'm into my podcasts. I listen to um, 
the the guy that wrote Four Hour Work Week. Dim Harris. Yeah, so I've listened to his, uh, but he produces a lot, so I'm very selective yes. in terms of which ones I actually listen yeah, to. Yeah, so I, I believe he's got like 400 podcasts already. Yeah, yeah there's a really good one which uh, I love, and it's called uh, This Week in Startups, and the guy is called Jason Calacanis. He's an investor in um, he's an investor in Silicon Valley, and um, He's funny, he's very blunt, he's direct, not everyone likes his style, he's a bit cocky, but um, it's really good quality uh, stuff in there, it's a lot of value, so I listen to that a lot. Cool. It's very tech orientated, that one. Yep. And he has, he has great guests, by the way, which are CEOs of, uh, of other companies, but big success stories, big failure stories as well, he has them in, so it's always good to learn from them. Alright. Um, is there any departing advice um, <laughs> let me think so I I can only say if I was to do everything again what mm-hmm. I would do differently so I would from day one I would start thinking about scale from day one I would look at the various programs available or systems or, or, or software or tools available to um, to, to help business, you don't start straight away out of a spreadsheet and Word documents. It's, it's not the way forward. Um, choose your investor wisely. Get someone that can add value. Um, I think um, working with VCs is highly beneficial. When you do so, make sure um, that if you do your if if you have limited um, if you had limited uh, experience in business modeling and you're not sure but you've come up with a kind of business plan which you're comfortable with and you know how much cash flow funding or financing you think you, you want make sure you double it so ask for uh, ask for more um, I think you, don't be too worried about giving up um, um, shares in business mm-hmm. uh, it, this is just a natural progression um, and yes the other thing I would actually yeah, so one key item um, and where I made my biggest mistake. So we received an investment of 850,000 euros. And um, this, for me, this was the first time kind of scale, trying to scale and, and, and spending money. And we, uh, in my original business plan, I had uh, set out a very aggressive rollout date for Romania, three months later Slovakia, three months later Czech Republic, three months later either Slovenia or, or Croatia. And um, you need to remember that when you, you're going in to see investors, you're, you're pitching them on, on a dream and you know, you're projecting numbers. The reason they're investing into your company is because they believe in your numbers, they believe in you. Um, and I think the, the main thing that I suffered with was how attached I was to this plan, this business plan. And, um, and to a certain extent, I had kind of this tunnel vision that, no, we need to roll out this market. We need to roll this. This is what I've promised. This is what I've said. And um, as a result of that, we burned ridiculous amounts of cash. And we burned, burned cash launching things too soon. Uh, we burned cash on, 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 on marketing where we weren't measuring the results of it properly and um, we, we didn't do the market research fully. We, we just tried to move far too fast and we, as a result we had to close the Slovak operation, the Czech operation, um, simply because we hadn't done our homework and um, we had to make some serious structural changes in, in the company which meant people lost their jobs. Mm. Um, so. That for me was the biggest learning curve ever and if I was to you know, give advice to anyone it would just be, you know, you've, you have to remember that you've got shared goals with your shareholders, whether that be your founder, whether that be your co-founder or whether it's investors or whether you've got an angel or your family have invested money in the business. So even if you're not going to be able to deliver what you originally promised and, 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 and set out as your dream, um, yet you need to... You put the brakes on and it's just because nobody wants to see it fail so there's no point in just flying towards yep. that wall because you think yeah I'm just gonna smash through it yeah sometimes you need to, to take some stock and I yep. think if I'd done that um, we would have uh, more capital available for us to spend uh, wisely so so uh, a little bit of patience goes a long way I th- 
If you can see something, yes, spend wisely, I think is what I'm trying to say. And if you can step back and just put yourself, if, if that was kind of your money, you know, what, what, how, how, how would you, what questions would you be asking if you'd given that to someone else? Mm -hmm. So it's like having like a third eye view on the whole business. Um, yes, I think you need to be able to, to, to question your own decisions, mm -hmm. but it's very difficult when you're, you're flying at 100 miles an hour and you're desperately trying to get users or sales, or yes. you know, it's very difficult to, okay. to stop. But you need to pull into the gas station and <laughs> grab take a, a break. Grab, take a break, <laughs> you know, as it flashes on the screen when you're driving. Yeah.